folks that are coming in. If you need to, scooch towards the center. I also have some chairs up here in the VIP sections. We had an excellent time yesterday at the pig roast, I hope. Food was enjoyable. In line with that, we do have some leftover utensils and dishware, I believe, on a table in the narthex, so please make sure you take your stuff so that we don't have to throw it away. <laughs> That's harsh. Yeah, I went right to the heart. <clears throat> Cut to the quick. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. Let's start our time together with a word of prayer. Please join me. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you that you call your people together like this. We can look around and we can see that we are not alone, that you, in fact, are doing great works within this world still today, even if it is difficult to see. Oh, Lord God, I pray that you would encourage your people as they're here. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to see that what they witness in this worship is the reality of the world. Pray, Lord, that you'd let them see your goodness, your power, your patience, your knowledge, your understanding, your wisdom. And I pray, Lord, that this would shape and mold us to continue the rest of our days as a witness unto you and your new creation. Lord Christ, as the King and Head of your church, I pray that you would do this here at Severn Run, but also across the face of the globe. And I pray, Lord, that your church would grow in her boldness, that she would not have her conscience dulled, thinking that evil is good and good evil, but that she would know your will and seek to do it. And I pray that you would use all of the services that are happening on your Lord's Day to accomplish such things. And may it all, Lord Christ, in your hands and by the power of your Spirit be ushered to the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. 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 Let's stand for our call to worship from Psalm 104. <clears throat> These all wait for you, that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May sinners be consumed from the earth, and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's sing together Psalm 27C.
Amen. Let us behold our Christ now from 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 9. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Behold your Christ. Let us pray together. Christ, it is easy to miss your truth. It is easy to miss who you are. It is easy to miss what you require of us. There is a great probability, in fact, that we have not only missed this past week all of those things, but we have suppressed those things actively in unrighteousness. And so we come to you in a time of confession. We ask that you would use the means of our elder this morning to lead us into truth, to bring our conscience back out into the light, and to name those things which are disgraceful, that you may remove our shame with your righteousness and establish us in fruitfulness and joy. Pray, Lord, that you take us from death to life during this time. In the name of Christ, amen. You may be seated. It's so good to gather with God's people in his house on his day. It is vitally important that we remember how frail we are, and this is why we confess our sins and have a period of assurance that comes directly from God's word. Well, I don't need to tell any of you that life is tremendously challenging. We are in October. That means the school year has been in swing for a full month. That is a challenge. If you happen to look at the news at any point in the last six months, you will see that the world is facing tremendous challenges. If we rested on our own understanding, it would seem like everything's falling apart. It would seem like nothing is going the right way and everything is about to just come crashing down. Well, I want to read for you this morning a psalm, a short psalm, Psalm 13. Our brother David thought things were coming crashing down in his own life, and so he says this, How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy exalt over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But... I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Brothers and sisters, as we contemplate the challenges of our life, the challenges of our individual households, the challenges of our nation, the challenges of the entire world, which if things are to be interpreted the way the news tells us to interpret it, it's we're heading down a really dark path. Does that mean God has abandoned us? It does not. And yet, brothers and sisters, I believe each and every one of us has a challenge to not feel like a God is somehow missing or absent. He is in control. He is in charge. Things are happening according to his plan. And we do not need to worry. We need to trust in his mercy. We need to have our hearts rejoice in his salvation. And we need to let our voices sing to the great God Jehovah who is dealing bountifully with you and with me and with the entire world. It is not hopeless because God is in control. And so in this time of our confession, I will begin by praying for us corporately And then there will be a time of silence for you to pray in your own heart and confess your sin to our God. And let us focus on the way that we 
seem to feel like God is not with us, remind ourselves what the Bible says. He is always with us. He is with us even to the end of the age. And he has all power and authority in heaven and in earth. There is nothing that is impossible for our God. Let us go to him now and confess our sins. Most holy and gracious God, you have time and again had to remind your people who you truly are. When we see difficulties in our lives that arise and challenges in the world around us, we forget who it is that you declared yourself to be on Mount Sinai. You are long-suffering. You are a God of mercy, full of compassion. You have mercy on whom you will have mercy. You love whom you love. It is all up to your sovereign choice, and so God Our Father, we submit to you this morning. We bow humbly before you, recognizing that it is all your choice. What happens is up to your plan and up to your wisdom. May we never lean on our own understanding as though we could do it better than you if you would simply give us the chance. But may we trust that whatever you have happening is for our best and our benefit. And so God, as we turn to examine our own hearts and think about the trials and challenges of our own lives. May your spirit well up within us. May it expel all thoughts that you are somehow wrong in what you do or mistaken in the order you have created. And instead, Lord, may your spirit give us the strength to humble ourselves, to fall on our faces before a righteous, holy, and awesome God, and to beg you to show us your will and your way, to protect us from ourselves and our own foolishness. And Lord, that we would give everything into your hands, trusting you to guide this world and our own individual lives. And now, God, I pray that you will hear the prayers of your people as they come to you in the silence of their hearts. We thank you, our Father in heaven, for hearing our prayers. Your word tells us that you hear the prayers of your people, that you do not ignore those who love you. And Lord, we trust that you have heard us and that you will indeed grant to us the answers to our prayers. We ask, Father, that you will transform our hearts, that we would be ready to receive your answer, whatever that may be. For we know that you are sovereign, and you do what you want. We are pleased to be submissive to you. God, thank you. Thank you that forgiveness is found in you and in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in case you were wondering, you do not need to stay in that place of humility. Though we will be humble throughout our lives, the the God who has uh, given us his spirit to convict us of our sin in his word tells us what he is doing. He says here in Isaiah 45, verses 22 through 25, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come, and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. Brothers and sisters, when you find yourselves wondering how God can ever take even your sinful life, and bring glory to himself. May this passage encourage you. God is in control. He has sworn upon himself that through you, through all the descendants of Israel, he will be glorified and you will be forgiven.
This is our great and awesome God. Together, let us rise and sing in response to the forgiveness of God. From my sins, O oh, hide your face, a portion of Psalm 51. Let us sing our praises to our great God. From my sins, O oh, hide your face, my Let us now have the ushers bring forward our tithes and our offerings that we may present them to our great God, and together we will sing the doxology. Son and Holy Ghost, we do indeed praise your holy name, for you have given unto us all that which we need for life and godliness. You have given us all of the physical blessings we need in order to honor you with our lives and for our families to honor you with our everyday existence. And God, you have given us so much. You have given over and above whatever we could have asked that now we come in gratitude, supreme gratitude to you, bringing part the first part of what you've given us back to you. And we ask God that you will use it to bring glory to your name in Anne Arundel County, that you would use it to show your absolute love to your people here at Severn Run and beyond. And we pray most fervently, God, that you will take these resources which we give freely with a heart that loves you and use it to expand your kingdom, to gather to us saints that they may be perfected here in the fellowship of your bride. We pray, God, that you will glorify yourself 
through the gifts we give here and now. And may we never forget where all blessings come from. They come from you. We praise you, our good and awesome God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. standing for the reading of God's holy word, and those who are uh, infants to the age three are dismissed to the nursery. Let's open our scriptures together to Judges chapter 15. Our portion this morning is, well, the whole chapter, uh, 1 through 20. Please follow along as I read. After a while, in the time of wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat, and he said, Let me go into my wife, into her room. But her father would not permit him to go in. Her father said, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Is, she not her, uh, is not her younger sister better than she? Please, take her instead. And Samson said to them, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Then Samson went and caught 300 foxes, and he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails. When he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyard and olive groves. Then the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they answered, Samson the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. Uh, think of the house being lit on fire there. Samson said to them, Since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. So he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Etam. Now the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and deployed themselves against Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? And they answered, and, and so they answered, We have come up to arrest Samson to do to him as he has done to us. Then the three thousand men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock, Etam, and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. But they said to him, We have come down to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hands of the Philistines. Then Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him, saying, No, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand, but we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him, then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it, and killed a thousand men with it. Then Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. And so it was when he had finished speaking, that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called the place Ramath-Lehi. Then he became very thirsty, so he cried out to the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance by my hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? So God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out, and he drank, and his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore, he called its name En Hakore, Hakore, En Hakore, which is in Lehi to this day, 
and he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Let us pray. Lord, all of your scripture is profitable for correction and rebuke and the health of your bride. I pray, Lord, that she would drink deeply today. And I pray, Lord, that she would, all of us, not just be hearers of your word, but doers unto your glory and the good of our neighbor. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. You may be seated. Last week, we talked about two hands. On the one hand, the church is filled with the Spirit and stronger than lions. But on the other hand, the church can give up its strength for the world's sweet temptations. Now, may God preserve our strength and may we be instead a sweet aroma, speaking of Christ. We continue with the Samson episode this morning. And so I have a few observations, and, and then we can really get into it with some applications here uh, as we go along. So please take notice to the things that I bring up. First thing I'd like you to see is in verse 1, uh, Samson returns to his father-in-law's house. Essentially, it, this is a little unfamiliar to, you know, bringing a woman a goat. Uh, I do not want to ask if any of you have brought a woman a goat. <laughs> Tell me later. But I think it's essentially about at the level of bringing a box of chocolates. And you're asking, and you can see Samson is asking for access to his wife. And the father says, if you were following the teaching last week, that's actually quite surprising. Uh, because he went off in a huff, remember? Went back north and just forgot about her. I'd already had mentioned that she was given away. And so we're pretty surprised that he's upset by this. But Samson, obviously, in verse 3, does not see things that way. And what you're going to witness is that the words of the father-in-law, in the face of Samson, the one who's impulsive, who always must have exactly what he sees at the time that he wants it, he's not going to be able to have what he wants. He's going to have a stop. And you're going to see him have a temper tantrum. And there's going to be a cause and effect relationship running throughout this whole thing. I almost felt out of breath reading it to you because there were so many verbs and actions going on. And I think that the Spirit means for that to happen. You should be out of breath and then you get to this rock and it's broken and you can drink. Well, that's the, this first observation is just noticing that the whole thing gets set off by the father-in-law's words. Second thing I want you to notice is this strange uh, response from Samson where he catches, it says 300 foxes. Uh, there, are, there were actually in that area many jackals. They look just like a fox. So whether it's a fox or a jackal, he joins them by the tail and he places torches in the binding. I want you to picture taking dogs that have tails and I want you to picture taking wire and wrapping those tails together so they can't get apart. And then you have attached a torch also and now what would those dogs do? They are not going to be happy, number one, and they're not going to run straight. And that's part of the point here is that they're going to zigzag in a chaotic fashion trying to get released from each other and they're going to do so through this wheat field and it's going to burn everything up. That was his plan. That's the point. Samson wanted the jackals to wend their way through the fields of wheat torching the whole harvest. And actually, when you look at verse 5, Samson does worse. He torched not just the standing grain, but the gathered grain. So you could look out on a, a field and you could see all those sheaves tied up together in big bundles. Today we see them in circles in the fields, or hay bales. Well, he burns all of those also, and we can even go further that he burns all of their vineyards and all of their olive groves. So what you have to see here is the degree of the crisis that Samson has created by doing all of this. He, a military leader from one nation, has just destroyed a year's worth of another nation's agricultural economy. You now have on your hands, on these pages of Scripture, an international crisis. 
created by one man and the collapse of another nation's economy. So accordingly, the Philistines, verse 6, are upset. And they go to Samson's known Timnite family and they burn them alive in the home. We've seen this several times already in Judges. And so Samson in verse 7 is further inflamed and he slaughters them. There is a catchphrase during this part of the episode. Did you notice it? The Philistine says, as he did to us, we do to him. And then Samson says, as they did to me, I do to them. It's evil for evil all the way through, keeping this cause and effect relationship where everybody's destroying everybody else. And that is continuing here as now the Philistines add uh, further fuel to the fire. They invade Lehi where Judah dwells. Judah is a uh, former version or a different version of its uh, former self. And it wants no conflict with the Philistines. And they therefore agree to track Samson down themselves and deliver him to the enemy. So now you have the nation itself rebelling against itself. Brother turning in brother. But this does not go as planned because Samson is filled with the Spirit of the Lord. He breaks the handcuffs, so to speak, and he grabs a fresh jawbone of a donkey. If it wasn't fresh, it wouldn't have done this kind of damage, but it was fresh, and he kills a thousand Philistines. Then Samson, in his rage, his conceit, and his arrogance, we've got to make sure we know who this guy is, his rage, his conceit, and his, his arrogance, in verse 17, he memorializes the work that he has done. And he says, this is Ramath Lahi, Jawbone Hill. Now, the reason why it's Jawbone Hill is because the, the hills refer to the mounds of bodies that he has piled up from his kills. Jawbone Hill. Now, when you get to this point, you should feel tired from all that you have witnessed here. And the same thing happens to Samson in verse 18 with all of his escapades. It's put in the terms of thirst and that he's not overtaken by the Philistines. God splits the rock to refresh his soul with water and his strength is revived. Now, I think I heard somebody when I was just reading the story, I think I heard someone gasp. And that is appropriate because the carnage in the episode is striking what you see here. And what makes it more striking is that Samson is accomplishing these grotesque acts by way of being filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And it can cause quite a bit of conflict within us when we see things like this happening. Is it, it is reasonable to wonder what in the world is going on here. And I think that the, well, I know that the author of Judges has given us, by way of the Spirit, a way to make sense of this. I want you to think about verse 3 of this chapter. Let me read it to you very quickly. Just think about this so we can make sense of all the carnage that we just saw. Verse 3 of this chapter, And Samson said to them, This time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Now this gives us insight because the word harm here or to do ill to them is the same word that we have seen in Judges before. In chapter 9, verse 23, it says this, God sent a spirit of harm or ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Do you remember those cause and effect relationships where one did to the other, and the other did back to that one what they had done to them? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, evil for evil, fire for fire. It is the same thing that is going on here that we see in 923, when God sent his spirit of ill will or harm, so too do we see the same thing taking place with Samson. And we can actually gain even further bit of insight why the spirit of ill will. We can gain further insight into this by remembering our capstone verse from chapter 14, verse 4. 
That is the answer to what's going on within the episode. It is the key to understanding Samson. And it says this in Judges 14.4, But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. The Lord did not want there to be peace or complacency between the nations, but for them to be stirred up into war against each other. And what you're witnessing here is that despite all of that carnage and mayhem, underneath of it is a divine order with God accomplishing all of His good purposes. And that's our doctrine this morning, actually. Despite all of the carnage and tragedy and chaos on the surface of human endeavors, God, though camouflaged or hidden, is there accomplishing his good purposes. I'll just say that one more time because, my friends, that is good news. Despite all of the carnage and tragedy and chaos on the surface of human endeavors, God, though camouflaged or hidden, is there accomplishing his good purposes. Well, I want us to look at two main things with this truth this morning, this heavenly doctrine. And I have two titles, The Hidden God and then God's Perceptive People. The Hidden God and God's Perceptive People. So let's begin with The Hidden God. It is good to remember that sometimes God camouflages himself and he is hidden. That is a good thing for us to remember to be able to make sense of our lives and I just want to step you through a couple scriptures where you can begin to see that this is not the only place where this is recognized. The Apostle Paul speaks about God just like this in 1 Corinthians, and he says this in chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, here we have these two hands again. Paul, on the one hand, points out that those who are meant to be wise have no wisdom. And this is proven by the fact that they just crucified the long-awaited Lord of glory or Messiah. If they had eyesight to see, they would not have committed the act. But they cannot see, and so they stumble along in blindness, killing their own salvation. People get themselves into places of pride, and they accept the wisdom of this world, and it blinds them from being able to see what is exactly in front of their face. And thus, God remains, remains hidden because they are ignorant and blind due to their own moral failure on the one hand. But there is another hand. I just gave you more of like the human perspective and how we contribute to it, but there's another hand, and it is this. Hidden to those, there are those who are, where God is hidden to those with an evil conscience, but on the other hand, looking at the exact same event of the crucifixion of the Lord of glory, listen to this from Peter's sermon. Acts chapter 2. 22 through 37 is the total passage, but I'll just read portions. Listen to what he says to this group of people. Same event referred to in 1 Corinthians. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death. And then we were to go down a little bit later into the passage. He's going to start wrapping up his inductive sermon, and he says this, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then we have this as a response from the crowd. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, 
what shall we do? Do you see the human moment and the hiddenness of God? In other words, if we were there watching the event unfold of Christ being moved to the cross and then executed on that cross, if it were standing right in front of us and you didn't have the theological insights and descriptions of the fourfold gospel or any of the Pauline letters, what would you see? What did they see? Why isn't it until there's an explanation that they're able to see? What could they see before they could see? You would see a crowd saying, crucify him, crucify him. You would see soldiers mocking this guy. You would see the sorrow of women looking on to the carnage of Jesus of Nazareth who had been flogged and flesh torn. We would see the skies covered in black clouds, making it like night. And we would say, as we watched this carnage and chaos before us, how fitting that in the middle of the day it is like nighttime. And we would probably say, where is God in this hour? It makes you wonder if across the minds of the disciples and the women who were disciples who were watching the whole event, if it ran across their minds, where is God? And yet, when we have the apostle here who can see, and he tells us the story, he reminds us that though God was camouflaged and hidden underneath all of it, he was accomplishing, Acts chapter 2, his eternal purposes at every moment and therefore was always present. Friends, what we end up seeing in the crowd to whom Peter declares the eternal gospel and plans of God as we see when they say, Peter, what should we do? we see their eyes opening to see what had been there all along. And it was God and his plan of redemption. God accomplished his good will despite and even in the momentum of the evil of mankind. Now, I bet you if we just open this up for conversation here this morning, which we're not going to do, even though I know you'd like that, we could come up with a whole list of examples where God is camouflaged or hidden, but then when we're able to see with theological depth, we could see underneath God is there controlling the whole situation and accomplishing his plans. In the midst of evil and carnage like we see with Samson, we would say the doctrine ourselves, despite all of the carnage, despite all of the tragedy and the chaos that we see on the pages of Scripture, or broadening out to all of the acts of humanity, all of their endeavors, God, though camouflaged or hidden, is there accomplishing his good purposes. It is a universal statement of the most universal degree as to what he is doing. And that is the hidden God. That is the reality of how God operates. But there is also his perceptive people, the church, who has been given eyes to see and ears to hear. Years ago, at night for some reason, now some of you have heard this story because you've been around here for a while. There's so many new people, I get to retell all my stories. <laughs> this is so great. It's like, you know, I already have the sermon material. It's good. Years ago, I don't know why, because I don't normally do this, but I glanced out my door at nighttime before we went to bed, and I saw in the glow of one of the street lights something that looked like a long, stretched out um, cloud of fog, like you'd see in the early morning over a soybean field or something. I saw that up. At the, it was all collecting around the streetlights that were going down my street. So I decided to step outside. I thought, this is so strange. Why is there a fog? I don't know what's going on. Is there a weird cold front moving in or something? And I stepped outside, 
and I could smell right away that there was burning wood. Specifically, I'm, this is going to get even stranger for you, but I smelled it and I said, that's actually burning Douglas fir. And I knew that because I had done some work on my house and remodeling, and I don't always cut very well, so I just kind of burn through the wood. <laughs> so I decided to go out and to check this out because I knew that the homes in the neighborhood are all made out of this wood. So you can see where this is going. I check, the, I check my home, I look up at my roof, there's nothing going on there. I start to look at the other homes, I don't see anything, but then when I go down a couple houses away, I see that from the ridge vent, there's smoke pouring out of this person's ridge vent and the sides of the home. And so, I start banging on their door. They answer casually, like nothing's going on. I step in, the whole place is full of smoke, and I'm thinking, did you not notice? But they were confused. They didn't notice. And so I uh, ushered this older couple out of the home, called the fire department, and the, fire, the firemen arrive, and they determine that there's an electrical fire in the attic, and they have to make sure that it is not heading down into the walls, so they have their, they're breaking things open, and we're standing out in the driveway with other neighbors. There's flashing lights and the, the noise of what the firemen are doing. They're washing certain things down with water. And the older gentleman, who had kind of just been staring at the ground, he raises his head and he says, where is God in all of this? And I have all my neighbors standing around and I'm the pastor. <laughs> So I said, I have no idea, and I went home. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, I actually don't remember what I said. But for whatever reason, I keep reflecting on that moment. Now, it's been years since that happened, but every year I think about the moment. I th because the, I think about the question. Where is God in all of this? And I actually think at this point, perhaps my brain will grow and I'll have some developing thought. But at this point, I actually think that what he was doing there in that driveway with those flashing lights all around us was the cry of humanity. Where is God? And then go ahead and substitute for the word this whatever it is for you. Where is God in the middle of this? And I have also determined at this point that I think this is one of the major reasons why the church is present in the world. The church is present and it is not always to have a quick answer to it but it is at least to be a witness, whether in word or deed, to say, we may not see where God is right now, but we do know that he is here and that he has good purposes. Now, that might sound like a cop-out to you, but I actually, as I'm telling you this story, I remember not coming up with some kind of catchy answer for him because the guy's house was burning. You want a two-second answer when, this, when misery strikes your life? It is more honest to sometimes say, I do not know in this particular situation, but I know that he's here and that he's good and that he has good purposes. He has proven that to me a thousand times. Now, what am I doing here? I'm pointing out that as a church, we must be a perceptive church and acknowledge that he in one way can be hidden, but by faith he may be seen. Because we know who he is. I really think, we keep going back to this as a congregation, I'm not sure if you've noticed this, but I really think the more deeply I think about that moment and that question, Habakkuk chapter 3, 17 through 18 really summarizes it very well. Listen to this again. 
Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food. You getting the picture? Though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. There is literally in that poetic passage no evidence by sight that God is present. And yet at the end, by way of faith, he acknowledges that he has joy in the Lord and his salvation. That, my friends, is the confession of the church in every age until the return of Jesus Christ. And even then, He is essentially saying, though God be hidden amidst disaster, I know by faith that God is good and brings good. And it raises certain questions. That guy's question on the driveway raises questions for us as a church once we realize that we are meant to be the perceptive people. You must ask yourself and do daily inventory to see if you have begun to lose your hope. Because if you have, you only see with your eyes, which means you do not really see at all. Have you been living by sight instead of by faith? Are your spirits down? due to all that you see around you. If you don't live in a cave somewhere with no electricity, then you're starting to see plastered across the screens of your TVs, nuclear. Surely as the church, we should never become calloused to evil. In fact, I believe that in every age the church should constantly cry this, How long, O Lord? Which is what we heard in Psalm 13. Thank you so much, Bradley. How long, O Lord? But we give that cry knowing that though camouflaged, God is always present, and even when He is silent, there will come a time when he speaks justice into the world. And all shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We know when we start to see things like this and we can reevaluate even our own lives relative to the chaos and the carnage that is around us, when we can do, when we can look at it theologically by way of the scriptures, we all know that we can hold close to our heart our main doctrine this morning. Despite all of the carnage and tragedy and chaos on the surface of human endeavors, God, though camouflaged or hidden, is there accomplishing his good purposes. My prayer is that you would be strengthened by that. Could you this morning not just be a hearer but a holder of that word. Oh Lord, how long? But in the meantime, Lord Jesus Christ, give us strength to see by faith. Lord, when you are camouflaged and you are hidden, Give us the eyes of faith. And Lord, may we, even in the midst of the most profound tragedies and misery, as the houses of our neighbors go up in flames, literally or metaphorically, we pray that you would always give us hope, that we would always see beyond the fire and the smoke that we would see through the burning flames of the furnace and always see one who stands like the Son of Man over all things, bringing about his goodwill 
that His creation shall return to paradise. And Lord, please help us to give such good news to our neighbors who are downtrodden. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's stand and enter into the mystery of the sacrament. And we're going to do so first by singing our invitational hymn together, There's a Fountain Filled with Blood, and I ask the elders to please prepare the table. Let us give thanks for this table. O oh Lord Christ, we thank you for knowing in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding what would be necessary for your church to be preserved throughout all of these ages as she waits for her heavenly husband. You strengthen us by your word and you attach to your word the words seen and tasted, particularly in this sacrament of the Lord's Supper. 
I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would strengthen your church, that she'd be able to continue amidst great misery. I pray that you would refresh her faith, that what you tell her would be more vibrant than what she sees with her very eyes. I ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 This is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is a special table set aside for his peculiar people. This is not a table open to all. We're going to distribute the bread and the wine here in just a moment. And when it is being distributed, it is Christ sending out health to his church. And therefore, if you are not a member of his church, then the meal is not for you. If you were to eat the meal being ignorant or having rejected Christ, you would just eat like we stopped at McDonald's or something. But that's not what this meal is. To eat this meal as Christ intends is to not just eat with the mouth or drink with the mouth, but to eat and to drink by faith. It is to see, as you will hear in the words of the institution, what the bread is to signify and to seal. And it is the same thing with the wine or the grape juice. What it is to signify or to seal. That is to say you are to feast together sacramentally in communion with the heavenly Christ by way of his Spirit. It is Christ sending his Spirit to his church that we are able to perceive the reality of the sacramental meal, seeing the work really of the entire Trinity encapsulated in the Son who has taken upon himself human nature, the great mystery of the ages. So this is our sacred meal, and it is actually with scriptural warning that I encourage you that if you are not a Christian or you are ignorant of the knowledge of Christ that you let the trays pass you by but I do encourage you to please come and speak to me or any of these men here about the mystery of godliness revealed. There's this warning in the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he, uh, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many die. But for you, Christian, Christ sends you this meal for your strength. You must take and eat. You must take and drink. And remember what God the Father is doing through his Son and the sending of his Spirit. The bread and the wine, therefore, are profound in their signification. I pray that you would just not eat this as someone who's just hungry for any old meal. This table has been set apart. And I pray that you would set these elements apart also in your hearts and that you would see them by faith. Let us pray, and then we'll distribute the elements. Christ, you alone give faith. It is a gift by way of the Spirit that you send, or who you send. <clears throat> I pray, Lord Christ, that you would let your people, that you would permit them to eat in faith. I pray that the measure of their faith would grow, and that they would see in the bread and the wine the whole counsel of God, what you are doing with your creation and its restoration. I pray, Lord, that though the real meaning of the sacrament lay hidden beneath these tangible objects, I pray that by faith your people would see, that they would see you, Lord Christ, that they would see the plan of the Father the execution of the Son, the fruitfulness of the Spirit and His consummation. 
I ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 We're going to begin with the bread. Brothers, the small cup has gluten-free bread, if that is your preference. And we'll take these elements together as a family. Thank you, brothers. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take and eat. Lord, there are many in this world who ridicule this table because they cannot see. Lord, there are many in this world that have no place, no effort in getting to the table, crying out to you for sight because they are so blind. But you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear, even as we see and taste the bread, as we commune with you by way of the Spirit, we are able to see your great incarnational work, the great work that you have done on the cross, 
the great work of your resurrection, the great work of your ascension, the great work of the power of your ascension and the sending of your Spirit across the globe, your day-to-day power demonstrated in the lives of your believers, and the hope everlasting of your return. All of this, Lord, in the bread. Lord, we thank you for the gift of faith, and may you strengthen us by this gift. In the name of Christ, amen. 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 We'll also distribute the wine. The wine is in the clear glasses in the outer rim, or rims, and the center portion in colored glasses is grape juice. We'll take this together as a family also. At Severn Run, and I imagine in many churches, the cup has always been known as the cup of joy. It is the cup of joy because it is the sealing. It is the signification of the sealing of the covenant that what God has said will be, will in fact be. 
despite what you see. It helps us, this cup, when he seems hidden. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, yet we will rejoice in the Lord. We will have joy in the God of our salvation. And this is the cup of joy. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us take and drink. Oh Lord, it gives us such hope to know that you have covenanted with us and that you have done so in such a fashion where you are committed to that which you have begun in us, you will finish. Lord, you are our preserver. You give us perseverance to finish the race. Lord, though it seems like we're going to be swallowed, you'd have the whale vomit us out anyways. Oh, Lord Christ, we thank you for the promise of our own resurrection. Oh, death, where is your sting? In the name of Christ, amen. 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 Let's stand and close our service praising our God. And now receive the Lord's benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Amen.